This video is going to be a look at the Ravens' intermediate passing game. I've tried to cover and present information on, on the quick passing game for the Ravens in 2023, their first season under offensive coordinator Todd Monk, and how, how the quick passing game helped Lamar and, and the entire offense, that is, reach levels of efficiency uh, with the pass game that had not been present before Todd Munkin's hiring. Also covered elements of the deep passing game, which were considerably inconsistent depending on location of the field. I think Todd Munkin came in and gave Lamar quick options to get rid of the football, good options, solid concepts that a lot of teams use. Like I said earlier, the deep, deeper passing game was at times inconsistent. I thought there were some situations where it was related to pass pro. Some were errant throws. Just accept it. But some of them are what I would call safe misses. Kind of addressed this on Twitter three or four days ago where I believe Lamar is putting the ball in a range of locations such that the outcome is either an opportunity for the wide receiver to catch the football or it's overthrown and falls incomplete, basically throwing it away from the defender, what I would call a safe miss. miss. But in this case, this video, I guess it'd be offense film study number three for the pass game. This will be a specific look at some of the intermediate pass concepts that Lamar and Todd Munkin use to reach top 10 in completion percentage and simultaneously be in the lowest five in terms of interception rate for a quarterback in 2023. Lamar was at his lowest interception rate ever, I believe, 1.6%. What I'm trying to build with these videos, with this series, I guess, is a way for Ravens fans to understand the efficiency and some of the concepts, the ways that Munkin attacks particular coverages or particular parts of the field, it's different than the way that Greg Roman attacked it while he was in Baltimore. And I want to give you, the fan, fans, evidence, film, that shows how good Lamar was at deciphering certain situations and then going on to the next read. Look, Munkin and his offensive staff, they had to set it up. That's their job. That's his job. All, Lamar also has to recognize it and then execute it quickly in the flow of the game. These are situations where I believe he did. And they're, most are not going to be play-action concepts early. Some might view them as simplistic when we get into the play-action portion of the video. I think, nonetheless, these are generally extremely demanding of Lamar and the wide receivers and tight ends running the routes in terms of identification of the coverage pre-snap and post-snap. I'm not going to overly focus on man coverages here. This is not to say that I don't think man coverage and how we attacked it was a big weapon. I, I actually covered that already in a, in a prior video, particularly talking about the slot fade. And so as a result, these are not going to be third down situations for the most part. Consider these 50-40 or 50-50 or 60-40 in terms of the run pass chances pre-snap that the defense has to consider. Basically situations where the Ravens are expecting a particular coverage based on personnel and location of the field, among other things. And Lamar and the wide receivers had to execute a concept based on that notion uh, by Todd Munkin and the offensive staff. So we're going to start with a variation on a tried and true uh, two-receiver concept called Smash. The Ravens run different versions of it, like most offenses in the NFL or college football and even high school. They tag different concepts on the back side of it. Sometimes it's levels. So Lamar can come back to it if there's nothing available on the front side, basically reading right to left or left to right. Sometimes it's a drag and a post. I've seen some true split field stuff where the backside concepts are totally unrelated to the smash concept on the front side. I would guess there that, Lamon that Munkin is um, expecting a split field look and gave Lamar an option to look to one side or the other and pick and choose where to target. We'll start this off with, like I said, a, a smash concept, which is a two-receiver route generally. There's different variations or iterations of it. This is 11 personnel against the Rams at home, week 14. Tight end is into the boundary, twins to the field. Twins includes OBJ. Uh, he's the point man. And as the outside linebacker is going to drop, push to the curl flat area, safety is also going to get depth. Lamar just unleashes a rocket to the field. It ends up looking like a cover two. Uh, by the Rams, you can see the, the corners with outside leverage in the flats. Aguilar is the, is the flat concept, occupying that flat defender. 
OBJ takes his route to the bottom from the bottom of the numbers to the sideline. Lamar gets rid of it quickly. Nice and clean, obvious. Obviously, Lamar was comfortable with it because Munkin went to this concept often. Now, this one ends up being an incomplete pass to likely. Week 16, sim similar throw from the standpoint of it's, it's to Lamar's right, but it's to the boundary, meaning where, where the tight end is. There's a little bit less space. It's essentially the opposite of what we just had in terms of the two receivers being lined up, this time to the field, the downside of our screen. They're not stacked like on the previous play, and then likely is, is set up wider from his alignment. He's not a, a th in a three-point stance, a traditional tight end stance. But Lamar actually has the right tackle in his way on his follow-through, so I suspect that that plays a pretty big role in this one coming out looking like a flyer. It's one of the reasons why the end zone angle is so important because sometimes the, the throw is impacted and people – a look at the throw independent of other factors. In this case, I think the right tackle being in his lap or near it um, has something to do with it. Additionally, the corner up to the top side <clears throat> decks Zay Flowers. So he gets a, a knockdown. And he's in a far better position than the corner for the Rams was. Again, there's less space up here to the boundary. There's, so it's a slightly different angle to the backside. You have you know, somewhat similar to a levels concept on the back side. So over here is one and two portion of the read. And then coming back to here, if Lamar did choose to come back here, would be three and four. <clears throat> you never know what a quarterback is told in their headset in terms of where to go in the progression, but you can look at the concept and you can tell generally what you've got. In this case, it's the corner is your read. If the corner sits on the flat route, then you throw the corner route. We saw the completion to OBJ on the first one. This one's incomplete to likely. If the corner was to get off here and get depth like a cover three, then obviously the route into the flats, Zay Flowers would be open. Someone else, either an inside linebacker, outside linebacker, or nickel defender, would be responsible for covering up that area. One of Lamar's most impressive throws of the year, if you ask me, intermediate, ugh, maybe it's it's short in, in distance. I think it goes down as a, a seven-yard touchdown. It's a third down, a touchdown to Mark Andrews in week four, against the Browns on the road. Again, it's to his right, Lamar's right. Tight end into the boundary, tight end receiver, running back, in fact. So three into the boundary. And I think it's Newsom to that side, opens up and gets to the running back. Gus Edwards actually going to cross face, so he's going to just zig his route back into the middle. But Andrews is running his route between the inside linebacker six and Newsom. And then he's bringing it here. Lamar actually wants to get rid of this a little bit earlier than he does. But he's not sure what the corner is doing in terms of dealing with that, that flat concept, that route that basically a, a speed out, a slow speed out, that is, uh, by Zay Flowers. Zay Flowers knows he's not going to get the football, in my opinion here, because he sees the coverage. Lamar wants to get rid of the ball now or, or a split second after I've paused this. But he's not sure exactly how this corner is going to react if he throws the ball back into this area where he ends up going. Once he sees the, the corner commit to Zay, and then he can fade back, I think it also, I'll show you the end zone angle here in a moment, which just does a brilliant job, pro probably better than, than I'm describing it, of showing you the, the accuracy. the look. Well, first of all, the clean spiral that you get out of this while fading back, but the accuracy, <clears throat> the, um, the confidence and trust that he has in Mark Andrews, pretty unique. The high point, it's a ridiculous catch by Mark Andrews. I love the the play, the throw, the obviously the execution of it. Also like the daringness of Lamar. I think there's um about 15 seconds left in the second quarter. The Ravens are up 14-3. Run this smash with with Zay out into the flats and and Andrews basically on on a fade, if you will, from this tight of an alignment. Pretty much impossible to not let someone get involved when you're down there in that space. But this, the level of difficulty on this throw and this completion, I think, is illustrated by that still shot right there. Probably nothing I can say that would uh, really do it justice. All right, moving on here a little bit. Still intermediate concepts, but these are mirrored concepts here. So this is week three at home against the Colts. These are pass plays that are designed, if you ask me, to show the wide range of reads that Lamar and the offense were able to execute in 2003. The routes honestly work out in a similar fashion to the smash concept in that one of the receivers is going to run a vertical 
and one of them is going to run out into the flats. It is different than conceptually than the, the previous iterations where the receiver to the outside, the outside receiver number one, ran the out, and then the inside receiver or tight end or slot would run the smash or the corner concept. So that's that illustration is reversed from what I just drew up. Additionally, it's threatening the smash route, if you ask me, which is why I'm showing this. He's threatening to take that route towards the sideline briefly for a moment and then just sits this down at the bottom of the numbers. The flat route by Andrews holds the curl flat defender in this, what I would call cover three, cover three variation for the Colts. When Flowers threatens the corner and then just stops on a dime at the bottom of the numbers, the ball's there. The ball is there on time for a nine yard gain in between the two second level defenders. Um, and that's against a, what I consider to be a really underrated young corner, Julius Sprints. He did only play nine games last year. I think he missed six games in a row near the middle of the season, but played particularly well in this game against the Ravens. Uh, the mirrored nature of it, I want to illustrate or talk about one more time. So just check out at the bottom of the screen. You got Bateman and Aguilar. So when I say it's mirrored, they're running basically the same concept to the downside, except Aguilar is a little bit slower getting out into the flats because he's chipping first. So he's not getting the width to match Andrew's route at all. But you can see the, scene, the same theme that's created to throw the ball to Zay Flowers is also created to throw the ball down here to Rashad Bateman. Different landmarks, bottom of the numbers for um, Zay Flowers, approximately three yards from the left hash for Bateman because basically where the ball was snapped. All right, one more example of this concept where you have a switch in the vertical release in the flat in terms of number one and number two. Uh, this, in this case, it's OBJ is, is the target, and he actually gets the, the catch. He played a really fantastic game, if you ask me, against the Bengals at home in Week 11. So you're going to get something like this, and then Tylen Wallace out into the flats. Bengals were in a dime look here against the Ravens' 11 personnel, which was interesting. I didn't remember them playing that as much as I saw it on film while I was prepping some stuff for this video. They've got a woozy who, if you've been watching my videos for a couple of years, you know, I think I think extremely highly of, especially pre-injury. I think it was an ACL injury two years ago. Got him lined up as a dime linebacker down here into the uh, boundary. <clears throat> and um, he's perhaps unfamiliar with, excuse me, unfamiliar with that type of defense, meaning being a second level defender. So the seam or opening that's created on this mirrored concept is the same one. It's not necessarily open up there to flowers, but it is down here. It's because a woozy is momentarily occupied by this underneath route to the running back, this late developing, kind of almost baited by the running back's late release. Lamar is absolutely on this side the whole time, meaning he is looking to that side the entire time during the read. Again, likely to the top side, isn't getting the same width as Tylen Wallace is down here, so not exactly the same uh, delineation of the routes in terms of the width by the, the flat route. OBJ had an amazing game, I thought, against the Bengals at home in Week 11. These are some of the situations where I think it's a two-man concept, meaning two routes are being run to one side, and it's a quick read. I would call these smash family, even though the second uh, route concept that I showed you is not called smash. You basically have a vertical release and a flat route. They're just originating from different spots on the field. I tried to package them from different games, different coverages as well. So you could see how comfortable Lamar was with the read, how quick he was with the delivery, and the accuracy. Look, the one that obviously sticks out is the one to Andrews. Again, my favorite throw of the year. I put something on Twitter yesterday about it. Given the pressure that Lamar was facing, meaning the pocket was kind of being pushed back in his lap, and the moment. The, the situation, late second quarter, Ravens on the road, ahead, 14-3, and it's third down. If you settle for a field goal there, yeah, you got a two-touchdown lead at the half, but, but a touchdown there really makes it difficult for the Browns to get anything done because they were working uphill the entire second half. Some of these plays that you'll see here in a moment are actually going to be game plan specific. Those that I just illustrated there or tried to illustrate to the best of my ability, were not game plan, game plan specific. 
They're just ubiquitous concepts that pretty much everyone uses. This is a past concept or play that I really didn't see repeated throughout the course of 2023. It's a tight end seam route to the boundary against the Colts. I, I clearly didn't foresee or have any knowledge of this before the game, but once the Ravens showed it twice early in the first half, you kind of start to think, okay, there, there must be a reason why they're calling this play and that it's successful, that it's such a high percentage throw that looks quite easy. The tight end running basically up the seam to the boundary in between the inside linebacker and the curl flat defender. Colts end up doing what I think Todd Munkin wants to force defenses to do, which is drop the boundary side safety down to either match three um, into the boundary. When I say three into the boundary, I mean the wide receiver, tight end, and running back combo lined up to the boundary with the ball on the right hash. So just to make sure I've illustrated this, there's the boundary side safety walked up almost as a second level defender, about a yard and a half, two yards is he there to stop the pass play? Maybe. Is he there to stop the same side run concept? Or maybe a keep by Lamar or an RPO? Certainly any of those or all. I don't think this is a read during the play, meaning a read progression. It's automatic because it's game plan specific. Once the Ravens go 11 personnel and Lamar sees the, the boundary side safety walk down and he sees the nickel alignment to the field, and the free safety in the middle of the, well, not really in the middle of the field. He's on the other hash. So he's, he's opposite the hash where the ball is. Lamar, I think, understood based on game plan, based on what he'd been coached, that he was going to get a version of cover three where the Colts are caught playing man to the number one receiver to the boundary. And in this case, the strong safety, the rolled up safety to the boundary, not matching the tight end vertical at all, wide open. But look, no matter what the safety does with the tight end, a running back combo, someone, someone's probably going to be open. I think this is an example of Lamar seeing something pre-snap that he's been coached on. So, so it, is, it is easy once you realize it's easy compared to other concepts, I guess is the way I should phrase it. Be because once you recognize the way the Colts are playing man to the outside receiver, and it, and it is Zay Flowers in both cases up here, same concept except Isaiah Likely is going to be the beneficiary of this. It's not a sound coverage by the Colts at all. It's a game plan specific play probably practiced during the week, communicated to Lamar in the headset, in the huddle, whatever whatever the word is for the play name, it worked. It was a 20-yard completion for both tight ends um, in the first half. I think it's a small example of something that showed up in one game specific to an opponent, the Colts, twice early, and wasn't a staple for the Ravens' offense. Why am I showing it? Because we didn't see it again. Let me know if you did see it again. And I think it illustrates the fact that the pass game progressed, advanced quickly to the point where in week three they were able to do game plan specific things that we ne that we hadn't necessarily been able to recreate before Todd Munkin's arrival, even though this is a relatively simple throw. All right, some play action stuff that is conceptually similar, uh, packaged together three or four plays in a row here. This is Andrews in week 11. You do have a vertical by number one, Flowers, running back late to the flats. In this case, it's Gus Edwards looking for someone to show up, and then he'll leak out into the flats to our right. Andrews over the top of the, of the linebacker level, almost eerily similar to that touchdown catch against the Browns in terms of the height of the throw um, and the angle that Lamar had. Even the distance and the way that Andrews goes up and gets it. It's a six-man protection scheme with Gus helping out briefly. If anyone shows, and like I said, they do not, so he slides out of there. Wonderful catch by Andrews. Small pump fake by Lamar. Don't want to just show play action concepts, but highlighting this right side of the field, the boundary side of the field, where Munkin, in my opinion, has a large portion of his offense designed to attack. I think the end zone angle gives a really high level appreciation for the concept. And yeah, Andrews is wide open from a separation standpoint, but Lamar still has a linebacker in the window and has to throw this ball over the top of any six foot three, six foot four athlete who can possibly get up there and elevate. In this case, maybe he threw it a foot and a half higher than he wanted to. Uh, the pass pro was there. It's a play action concept, so perhaps people wouldn't like it being included. But here's a couple more. This one's 22 personnel against the Titans. Lamar under center. You got the fake to Justice Hill. 
It's a split flow action. So when I say split flow action, you got a running back hill going to, to our left, the downside of the screen, and then Ricard going to the top side, the offense's right, to assist in pass pro with Kolar. I think it should, for us anyway, when we saw split flow like that, immediate flow, immediate stop for the inside linebackers out of the eye. There's a lot of eye concepts where you have full flow and split flow for a lot of teams, not all, is a, is a quick indicator that it's play action pass. Obviously, I'm not sure for all teams in the NFL, but for the Ravens when they're under center, split flow is play action pass. Anyway, I think Andrews is looking for another outbreaking route, similar to what we had to the downside of the field, or downside of the screen, excuse me. I think Andrews is looking for another outbreaking route, but watch what happens when he gets near the top of his stem. First of all, Aguilar on the clear out kind of bumps into the safety. Andrews is Putting the brakes on here, originally going to, if you if you ask me, move towards the sideline. But he sees the leverage of the safety, stops his route. Lamar sees the same exact thing, has time. Look, it's Max Pro, okay? And, and he finds Andrews near the left hash, 21 yards. Cool play, one that I think we'll see more of in 2024 with, with Derrick Henry and Ricard in the backfield, under center play action, utilizing... Uh, taking advantage of teams that are, stay in their base defense against 22 personnel, which most teams will. Running back one more time from the end zone angle so you can see the split flow nature and how <clears throat> that helps out Kolar on the edge here, even though I think Landry backs off. Landry's another terribly underrated guy, in my opinion. So Kolar doesn't release. You've got him and Ricard. I think there's the possibility for something like this in a screen to a tight end, but this... This 22 personnel is, is a pain for the defense with Andrews on the field, or likely that is, because 95% of the teams are going to be in their base defense, meaning their base 3-4 or their base 4-3. It presents the offense a two wide receivers into the boundary and then two tight ends, a two tight ends to the boundary, excuse me, and two wide receivers to the field. This formation does the same thing. Even though it's not 22 personnel, Andrews isn't on, obviously, because we're playing the Dolphins late in the season. You've got Ricard and Kolar down here. Um, as this kind of inverted twin wing, meaning Ricard is the fullback, he's the inside tight end, and Kolar is the outside tight end. On the Ricard issue, I'll address this a little bit later, Ricard is a tight end sometimes when he lines up there. But he's not a tight end from a personnel standpoint because he doesn't run tight end routes meaning the routes that likely and Andrews and even Kolar run are not the type of routes that Ricard runs when he's in the game. Positionally, in the playbook, he's not playing tight end. He's playing a fullback tight end hybrid position that other people have different labels for. Anyway, 21 personnel here against the Dolphins later in the season. The Ravens accomplish the same task, but it's a far deeper route. Really, um, um getting away with too much here from a, in a gray area, calling this an intermediate concept. But you got Ricard and Kolar down at the bottom side of the screen, the tight end wing, and the twin receivers to the top. It's, it's twin wing A. All of this is designed to get the flowers, the ball to flowers, in my opinion. Kolar and Gus release um, late after the chip, and Ricard is in straight pass pro. Anyway, I think you've got Bateman up at the top side, number one receiver. I think he's briefly reading the safety here. I think he's seeing the safety and trying to bring this route back into the middle of the field to give the sideline to Flowers. Basically, pull the corner with him and give Flowers all the room. So I'm talking about Bateman here with the corner. I think this is a design play. Look at the depth of the drop that Lamar got, how far back he is. <clears throat> I would say it's very similar to what the Ravens did with Andrews on that 22 personnel play against the Titans. The only time, the only thing is, is you know we're in 21 personnel here, different formation. It does elicit the base defense for the um, for the Dolphins. You got two inside linebackers, one edge defender who unfortunately got hurt during the game for the Dolphins, and then Van Ginkle, who since signed with the Dolphins, is off screen to our right. The the offense is right. Definitely a really good pass drop by him. Again, this really can't be classified as an intermediate throw because it ends up being a a 27-yard gain to Flowers. It was a real problem for the Dolphins that way that day. I think opposing defenses are going to have to make some tactical concessions. 
against our 21 and 22 personnel. Basically, why are there two safeties here? Because we've got three to the boundary. Two DBs there, excuse me, one corner, one safety. We've got three to the boundary. Look at how the Dolphins have lined up to this. Why do they have six players over here to the boundary? Because we have six players there. You say, Coach, it doesn't add up six to me. Well, this is how you count them. You got four on the first level. Five is the running back. Anyone on the midline, in this case, Lamar and Tyler Linderbaum, counts for one half each. So you got five plus one half plus another one half. That equals six. So numbers-wise, the, the Dolphins' defense is absolutely balanced. Six on six. There is some real control here being exerted by Munkin with the 21 personnel group because there's only two, two DBs to the field along with Van Ginkle who will play no role at all. At that depth you see there, you've really isolated Zay Flowers against the safety down the field. I expect more calls like this one, more concepts, but even more two-way calls, meaning two-play calls, excuse me, meaning if you didn't get this type of alignment, say that the inside linebacker's feet were there and there, and so we had a full man advantage to the boundary. Well, then I think you'd see Lamar with some type of same side run and a give to Derrick Henry or Justice Hill or Keaton Mitchell once he comes back. I think you really get a sense here, finally, of how much time Lamar has uh, from the end zone angle. There's not only a control feature of the personnel that the defense matches with, meaning Munkin knew he was going to get base 3 4 and only four DBs, but there's also this. <clears throat> aspect of controlling the stunts that the defense can and will use. So what I mean by that is with no nickel defender on the field, I suspect, I wonder if certain teams' blitz packages are less diverse. Now, I can't prove that. That's just a thought that I have. And, and it doesn't apply across all teams, all defenses in the NFL, because I know that would sound crazy if I said that. But here's what I mean. You can control the blitz packages if you know the blitzes they use out of their base defense versus their nickel, you can whittle down or, or minimize the blitzes that your offensive line and your guys could potentially see. I do think the 21 and 22 personnel, and 12 personnel for that matter, could be a big weapon for the Ravens because of not just the guys that are on the field, but also the controlling of the blitz packages slash coverages that opposing teams' defensive coordinators are willing to play. Now, that dynamic changes every week, depending on who the D.C. is, and that will, of course, lead to more work and more responsibility for Todd Munkin, the offensive staff, and Lamar Jackson to be prepared for each of those unique challenges every week. We will take a look at one more play-action concept, totally different personnel grouping, 20 personnel with Ricard actually lined up at fullback, Three wide receivers on the field. I think that one's going to be an extremely dangerous personnel grouping for the Ravens in 2024. Derrick Henry, Pat Ricard on the field at the same time with three wide receivers, regardless of who they are, I think is a real problem. It's a sniffer set, what I call a sniffer set, meaning the running back and fullback are on the same side. Fullback is almost directly in line with the tailback. In this case, he's a little bit offset. Play action. You got a, a clear out route by Zay Flowers at the bottom side of the field. Deep over concept, essentially, from the slot receiver on the other side. Lamar does take a hit, but he understood what was happening there. Ricard's late release was going to give the window to Lamar to kind of throw it over the top of the linebacker level, the second level, if you will, such that Aguilar was pretty much wide open here. Ricard is being matched by Al Shahir, a fantastic football player, if you ask me. Lamar's getting ready to take a hit. Simpson has been beat at left guard. No one has picked up. Aguilar, they were rotating the safeties back to the field. So number two from the field was able to defeat them or thwart the coverage into the boundary. Last play action example there. This one is not. This one, week nine, home win against the Seahawks. Pretty much a levels concept between Andrews and the number two receiver, Aguilar. It is a third down. They're not playing man uh, except to the top side. Tariq Woolen is playing man on OBJ. Look at the depth you've got. I think it's a third and six, third and seven. Look at the depth of the inside linebacker, Wagner. Andrew's going to carry his route vertical, untouched, squeeze back into the middle of the field. Aguilar going to go underneath, hence why I'm calling it a levels concept. Again, you've got man back here. A lot of quarters or split field coverages are man on number one regardless of release unless he goes under. In this case, it's man to the backside. Same thing the Ravens do, into the boundary. 
But Lamar's getting rid of the ball quick. You can I should have given you the end zone angle. You can see Lamar's feet is on the left hash, and he's throwing it pretty much down the left hash. Bobby Wagner doesn't appear to be in bad position to react to it, but Lamar is throwing that ball wider than the hash, a little bit more towards the top of the numbers uh, to give Andrews the ability to run onto it. I'm trying to give you multiple examples of intermediate routes, most of which not on third down. This one is. from Starting from the right, working our way to the left, and in the last couple of cases, actually targeting the backside X receiver. Now, I can't show this route from the All-22 because I think the NFL, <clears throat> Kurt Warner on the NFL channel, covered it and showed it, so hopefully I'm able to show it. And this one without a copyright hit, it was the fake sluggo by Bateman, so basically faking a slant and then sluggo and then bringing the route back. Totally lost uh, the DB. I think it's Carter. Thomas, excuse me. We'll show it one more time just from the end zone angles. Lamar is <clears throat> able to target the backside X a whole lot more in this offense. Play action concept briefly. You got the backside inside linebacker turning his back, looking for that same route by Aguilar that we just showed the completion against the Titans, basically from the slot going into the boundary. And in this case, the boundary side safety 31 is dropping down with the running back Ends up looking like a cover three. Again, I can't show you the all 22. One more time, I'll let you see the boundary side safety 31 spin down. Then we'll show you a somewhat similar route concept that was ran at home against the Seahawks. So as there's the play fake and Gus Edwards is crossing Lamar's face, boundary side safety spinning down, boundary side inside linebacker looking to help out with three crossing, Kolar just sitting underneath his own. Lamar already understood where he was going with the football. Quick recognition, some of the things that I think Bateman can do on the backside one-on-one -on -one against particular DBs or most. Uh, and last check it here on an intermediate concept that I hope you, hope you enjoy, even though it's a fumble, is OBJ on the backside. Somewhat similar to the route that I just described with Rashad Bateman. It's not exactly a sluggo or fake sluggo. <clears throat> Stop and go, and then pulls this back towards the sideline. Of course, it ends up being a fumble. Really poor ball security. When you look at the film of Lamar from 2023, there were things that he got better at. But I think it was also the smoothness of the offense, the integrated nature of a lot of the run and the pass concepts, and then how often we were running those concepts, how comfortable Lamar got with the offense, with what Todd Munkin was calling, and how prepared he was. The two plays I showed you against the Colts, I'll try to reference them and explain what I mean. Game plan specific things seemed to be more to occur more often, excuse me, in 2023, particularly in the past game than they did under Greg Roman. I found our offense under Greg Roman, while we did have times it was incredibly effective. Think of the playoff loss at Cincinnati in 2022. We totally outcoached their defense, I thought. Nonetheless, it seemed like we ran our plays. We ran our plays and you either stopped us or you did not. There was definitely a level of the defense knowing what was coming, basically tipping our hand, telling, giving the defense our intentions based upon the personnel group and the formation. A lot more widespread play usage from different personnel platforms in 2023. So that makes Lamar look better as well because he, he's in a more diverse offense that's spreading people out horizontally and attacking people vertically. That wasn't the focus of this video, the vertical attack. That's why I didn't address it in this video. I've already covered it. I think... In other video form, I'll try to link it up here. What I wanted to do was look at some intermediate concepts that Todd Munkin and Lamar used often against particular coverages, against particular teams, exclu uh, exclusive of man, not trying to attack man defense, but trying to attack some of the quarters, split field stuff, cover two, Tampa two, cover three, that we see often that is being used in, in more propensity across the NFL and college football and even high school than ever before. The split field coverages, I think, are really changing the game. The game. And Todd Munkin's offense, in a lot of ways, prepares Lamar for that. It gives him different route choices on either side of the field, and he can focus on whichever side he wants based upon the pre-snap read and what he sees immediately. I thought that this, what I tried to do with this in video, my, my video, this video, my intention was to give you guys intermediate concepts to Look at the reads, the way that Lamar makes them, the progression he goes through on some of them, the quick nature of some of them. 
the two receiver routes, particularly Smash and all the variations I tried to illustrate in the beginning, give you an idea of how good a job Lamar and Todd Munkin and the offensive staff did getting everyone on the same page, receivers, tight ends, Lamar. In terms of their recognition, the attacking to the boundary element is like a jab or even a double jab. And I think that Derrick Henry is going to be a multiplier effect toward that end. Attacking to the boundary, using Derrick Henry into the boundary, away from the nickel defender and 11 personnel is going to be a real problem. And that includes 20 personnel. I would like to do a standalone video on 20 personnel to see, try to for, foresee and predict what the Ravens might do from a run pass standpoint. I think 20 personnel is, is a very interesting and effective grouping for the Ravens. It already was in 2023, and it can be even more so with the inclusion of Derrick Henry. You guys have to let me know if you enjoyed this video. Please, if, you, if you're if you interested and you heard me talk about it multiple times, go back and watch some of the other stuff that I've described. The short passing game, quick concepts, three-step, to get the ball out of Lamar's hands, in playmaker's hands. Increase Lamar's pass percentage. Make him more efficient. Hold the ball. Don't hold the ball as long. Basically, get it out of his hands. And then when we when we need him to make a play with his feet, call different plays. Munkin referenced that, saying sometimes you call two plays at once with Lamar. You call the pass play, but you also design the routes such that if he escapes out the left side, he's running onto wide open space. thought that was a genius comment sometime around week 14 or 15 by Munkin. I think he said he realized that as the season went on. And then also take a look at the deeper – deeper pass concepts and the results of it that I thought were relatively inconsistent. But I do attribute to Lamar being a risk-averse quarterback at times, trying not to put the ball in a position where the DB can make a play. If you appreciate the series of videos I've tried to do here on the Ravens passing game, please let me know. If you think there's something that I've left out, also let me know in the comment section. Feel free to message me on Twitter if you think there's something I, I left out here or didn't address. Didn't really talk about pass pro a whole lot. The routes being run. What Lamar's reading, I think, at a high level, and the stats really showed it from 2023 and the second MVP award. Appreciate you guys' time, man. If you think other Ravens fans would enjoy this video, this third film study, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever, film study look at the Ravens' offense, particularly the pass game, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media to help this content get more reach.